This is A Confused Heap of Facts, the podcast where we have a discussion about history with the faculty of the Department of Military History in the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, or U.S. Government. And uh, one of the many things that Dr. Osman works on is uh, soldiers in the French army, particularly in the, the 17th century. Uh, so let's start off kind of broadly, Dr. Osman. What, what's the view that even today a lot of scholars have of old regime French soldiers, kind of who they were, what their characteristics were, and how we write about them? So I think kind of the general pervading impression that historians have of the early modern French soldier is that he, it was a he, uh, was someone who was cold, miserable, downcast, undereducated, often desperate, inherently violent, um, and very separate from the rest of society. Mm -hmm. And uh, how have you found in your research that these impressions are incorrect? Um, I have found that just like anything, if you if you tend to make broad statements about something, once you zero in on an individual, you find that that individual doesn't adhere to the broad statement. And so, I, of course, I'm finding that with French soldiers. I've been lucky enough to find um, uh, a, a bunch of uh, court cases uh, for soldiers who deserted from their regiments in Franche Comte in 1705. Um, and so it, the way that the procès verbal, the way that the court case is arranged, is that an officer is asking the soldier a question and the soldier has to respond and then that response is recorded. And so it's about as close to soldiers describing themselves and explaining themselves in their own voice as I've been able to find. And so you get to know these individual soldiers as individuals and then you find that, oh, well, they are free agents or they play the system or um, you know, they decided to give the army a chance and decided they didn't like it very much, you know, or they come from various different backgrounds, or they joined the army full of optimism and hope and were actually quite happy. Um, and it disrupts uh, the kind of pervasive, pervading um, impression that historians have propagated for the most part about the early modern French soldier. Yeah, so one of the barriers we have, and you've kind of discussed one of the ways over it, but one of the barriers we have is a, a, a good number of common people, including soldiers in the, in the pre-modern period, are just simply illiterate. So records don't necessarily exist, and then you have the added burden of, even if they are illiterate, even if they did leave records, the records don't always survive, uh, which is untrue in some ways of upper classes where the records are more likely to survive and they're more likely to be made in the first place. Um, so how have you circumvented these issues with, with the perpetuation of records to the present? Sure, so um, it is true to a degree, and I mean, especially right now in kind of the broader history field, we are trying to get away, uh, we are trying to get away from the archive. We're trying to get into kind of a post-archive way of gathering evidence about people who did not leave writing behind, because of course the vast majority of people in history did not leave writing behind in their own voice. And so we keep telling stories about the same kind of people over and over again, or writing history about the same kinds of people over and over again, and continuing to not talk about you know, the huge swath of people who existed outside of the archive or who at least don't have their voices represented um, in the archive. Um, in terms of uh, French soldiers, um, when you do read about French soldiers in the archive, um, you're almost always reading an officer's perspective or account of that soldier, or you're reading maybe an angry civilian's complaint um, about a soldier. Uh, and so, you know, you tend to collect stories of soldiers or kind of general references about soldiers as kind of fitting to the stereotype of being violent or nasty or, or um, hungry, underpaid, miserable creatures, um, always passive and always kind of under the will of their officers. Because the officers, when they write about soldiers, broadly speaking to each other, they just refer to soldiers in a very generic sense, like, I had to hang three soldiers today for desertion. 
and that's it. They don't even mention the soldiers' names. Mm-hmm. Um, or they might write like a big memo to the Council of War saying, oh, we need to do something about the problem of desertion in the army, and we need to do this with soldiers or treat soldiers that way or make sure we recruit soldiers in this way. So soldiers are always broad, never personalized uh, uh, in that sense. So what I've, what I've been looking for to try to um, understand soldiers better is first of all acknowledge um, and this we already know, but we I think we've been very lazy about as historians, is that you know there is no kind of generic soldier. So even from a pure military standpoint, when you talk about a French soldier, who are you talking about? Are you talking about a member of the French line army? Are you talking about a member of the militia or the milice? Are you talking about Swiss troops? Because mm-hmm. um, the Swiss was a particular element, um, a, a group of troops that have been kind of working with the, the French line army and doing very specific tasks for French defense for a while. Are you talking about the Maison Militaire, which was kind of the king's bodyguard made up of very high-ranking, high-status nobles? Are you talking about the milice bourgeoisie, which kind of refer to um, local defensives, like within a town, um, things like that. So there are already multiple different kinds of service member or, or militaire, military person, that you could be referring to when you just say the generic term soldier. So the one thing I think historians need to do is just a better job of acknowledging that. Mm-hmm. Second, in terms of finding um, sources or finding things in the archive that do allow soldiers to speak for themselves, is that one, I got just very lucky. I was using... Um, I was pulling boxes from a series uh, called A1 in the Vincennes Archive, which is the the main archive for the French army in in France, uh, just outside of Paris, and I just happened upon a whole series of these desertion court cases. And because these desertion court cases are designed in kind of an, an interrogation response fashion, I get to hear, so to speak, or at least I get to read soldiers' responses almost as they are coming out of their own mouths. And so mm-hmm. that has been tremendously helpful because in these interrogations of the soldiers, the officers are very thorough in, ask, in, in establishing certain facts about the person on trial. So they will always ask, you know, how did you join the army? Did you join of your own free will? How much money were you paid? Who recruited you? Were you happy in your regiment? Were you paid regularly? Did you get enough bread? Did your captain treat you well? Did your sergeant treat you well? Why did you run away? Who found you? Where did you go? What were you thinking? Did you know that deserters were punished? So they always ask this series of questions and it allows for a soldier to tell their individual recruitment story, uh, how happy they were in the army, what their experience of service was like, etc. And so that's been very useful. Um, But that's just one cache of documents from a specific region in one year. Mm -hmm. Um, Beyond that, um, I've been able to really comb through the campaign correspondence from this same series, this um, uh, A1 series, uh, to see what kind of stories officers are sharing with each other. And these are usually low-ranking officers. I usually can hardly even make out their names because their signatures are always very um, hard hard to read. Um, but they're describing stories of just like, you know, strange things that, that their soldiers get into. Um, and one example might be that, you know, there's a letter that I have um, that was written to a low-ranking officer by a member of the church saying that he was very sorry for punching a soldier in the face, but he punched the soldier in the face because he was walking his dog and the soldier passed by, picked up his dog and tossed his dog into a pit. And the clergyman responded by punching the soldier in the face and now feel sorry about it. So I'll have a, a really interesting snippet of part of a story like that. Right. Um, and then I have the joy as an historian of trying to figure out what what happened. Why did the soldier pick up the guy's dog and throw it in a pit? What pit? Did the dog survive? Uh, I would have punched him too. Um, and so I get to kind of think about that and try to put it in the context of, you know, where was this letter from? What was going on at the time? Um, uh, was this was this when the army was on campaign? Were they wintering in a town and having issues with the locals? And that's where a lot of the good stories come out is where there might be some kind of conflict between um, an individual soldier and and the, the town members that they're garrisoning with. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things I think that that's kind of a... a a delicate part of doing this kind of study is, as you say, to not universalize the soldier. Um, and a, a lot of people might be familiar with kind of the fraught works of somebody like an SLA Marshall or Dave Grossman. The idea that, that soldiering has always been soldiering. And if you know soldiers from one era, you know soldiers from another era. Or I work in an army institution. If you know Joe, you know Joe. Um, why do you think that's, that's so, so incorrect to assume that Joe is Joe? And then, how do you avoid universalizing 
Well, I have to say, and I have to admit to be perfectly honest, that there have definitely been times when I've been reading about um, these various little stories or small anecdotes about soldiers, or I've been reading um, uh, uh, things that, that soldiers likely wrote. I do have a few letters that soldiers wrote, and I do have a few poems that I think soldiers wrote. Um, and uh, I'm reading them and I'm thinking, this, this could be a service member right now. Mm -hmm. And there have been times when I've presented at a conference and, um, you know, say, say an army captain comes up to me and says, these, these could be my guys today. Um, right. And I think that's just, you know, I, I, I think that there's nothing wrong with identifying with people of the past. I think we inherently do that anyway, and it's part of what makes history fun. Um, but I do think that we have to keep in mind at the same time that, you know, the, the time and place... Um, in early modern France had its own specifics and it, we would be doing a disservice um, to the people who had to live through that particular place and time to assume that it was just like ours and that they understood things the exact same way. Right. Um, whether it's in terms of the physical world because the, the, um, old regime, the world of old regime France was much more visceral, much more physical, um, much harder on the senses than I think our world is. Um, also, they had, they had different life expectancies, they had different spiritual understandings, they had different education levels, they had different priorities. And you, so you need to take, as, insofar as you can, you need to take each person um, on your own terms. Um, and I think it's a bit, uh, I think it's a bit of a, of, a, of a risk to kind of assume we might understand something when we don't, or to assume that maybe, have, maybe have a bit too much confidence in our own discoveries, our own principles, our own sciences, our own health discoveries, and thinking that, oh, we understand this now. Poor things, they didn't understand it back then. And then to take something from the present and impose it back in time. Because right. the people of the early modern era didn't think in 21st century American terms. Mm -hmm. And so we need to try to understand the ways that they thought and the kind of world that they experienced. And I try to do that. Yeah, so let's dive into some of the so detail that you talked about. Um, first of all, with the, the paper you presented here about these, uh, these court cases. Uh, so one of the points you made in it that I really liked was to, to give these men agency, to, to make them be more than just you know, anonymous people in a uniform. Um, so, so what did you learn about them and their agency from these cases? So first, let me clarify that I did not give them any agency. They had the agency. I just got to read about it. Um, and that is one of the things that surprised me when I was first reading through these court cases. And to be, to be honest, like each court case is handwritten in really bad handwriting, with very <laughs> irregular spelling. And so each court case takes me several days to get through just to try to parse out what, what the letters are and what the words are and then have to go back and actually try to figure out what's being said and then make meaning of it. Um, so uh, it's a kind of a long, laborious process. Mm -hmm. um, but what surprised me when I was reading them was that um, some of the soldiers, uh, uh, not all of them, but some of the soldiers seemed to have a certain amount of professional pride in what they were doing. And according to the historiography, they're not supposed to have professional pride in what they're doing in 1705. In 1705, right. they're supposed to be miserable conscripts kind of going with the, the stereotypes um, that's in the historiography. And so, because again, we have this wonderful question and answer set up, um, you know, you have things like the case of uh, a soldier named Rencontre, who was 23 years old, um, he had joined the army willingly, he enjoyed being in his regiment, he was paid regularly by his own testimony, he was happy with his lot. And then one day, uh, a fellow soldier named Montagne said that he could make more money plying his trade with the Cologne army. And this is during the War of Spanish Succession. Um, you know, Cologne is involved in that war. Um, it is not the French army. It's in, it's in, you know, what we would think of today as Germany. Um, and so Montagne and um, uh, Rencontre came up with this wonderful plan of, you know, going north to Liège, meeting up with some friends, getting some passports, going into Germany, and then being able to ply their trade for an army that would pay them more. And that was that struck me as very bold. And uh, they they started their plan. Rencontre and Montagne got as far as Luxembourg, where they sold their weapons to get money. Um, and remember, these aren't really their weapons; they belong to the French army. But they you know they they sneak out, they sell their weapons, they have some money. Uh, unfortunately for Rencontre, he's discovered in Luxembourg. He's taken back to his regiment, uh, you know, where he is tried. And I'm, I'm reading the trial. And during the trial, they ask him like, "Were you mistreated in your regiment? You know, did you?" You know, w were you treated poorly by your sergeant? Were you not given enough to eat? Um, and he says, no, no, I was very happy in my regiment. I was well treated. 
And you can kind of hear in the text, you can kind of hear this pause where the, the interrogators are kind of looking at each other and thinking, I mean, let's, let's, no, no, surely, surely, you must not have known that soldiers who desert were punished. Did you know that soldiers who desert were punished? And he says, yes, no, I've been told many times that soldiers who desert are punished. And then they say, well, do you have anything else to say for yourself? And he just says, no. And they hang him that afternoon. Mm -hmm. And he's 23 years old. And um, whenever I've, you know, imparted this story to, to my colleagues, uh, because it is so striking, you know, they've asked questions like, well, was he being tortured at the time? And I don't have evidence that he was being tortured at the time. Or, you know, they ask, well, was he covering for someone? Was he taking the fall to protect someone? And the only other person mentioned in the whole account is Montaigne, so maybe. But again, he's not saying, I am trying to protect my friend. Um, uh, so if I take him at his word, which is what I want to do with these soldiers, I mean, this is one of the rare occasions where they get to express themselves on their own terms. So I want to take them on their own terms and believe them when they tell me something. Mm -hmm. um, so if we take him on his own terms, no, it's just he is a free agent. He is a professional. He is plying his trade. He wants to go where he's going to get paid the most. Um, it didn't work out for him, but he's owning his fate. Mm -hmm. He's not begging. He's not pleading. He's not coming up with excuses. He is owning his own fate, and he dies master of his own fate. Um, and so you, you have to have, you know, a certain, you do have a certain kind of response to that. Mm -hmm. So you also mentioned that you, you've drawn sourcing from uh, poems written by soldiers. So what, what have you found in those that, that has added to this kind of understanding of the soldiers? So the poems that I found, and I have three so I don't have a bunch and there may be more that's the thing I think that we as historians have been so um, accepting of the idea that soldiers are just illiterate and that they could never have written anything and they could never have read anything which I now know is very wrong because I have all kinds of evidence that many soldiers um, were literate uh, uh, probably certainly not all of them but many soldiers were literate enough anyway that I think that we've kind of trained ourselves not to see evidence of soldier literacy or soldier literature um, when we're presented with it so this is something that I, I think everyone as historians, and there's so many sources to look for. There's no way that I as an individual could get it through over the course of my career. Um, so I think we all need to just be more uh, attuned to it. But the, the three poems that I do have um, come from the Mazarinade, which were a series of pamphlets that were published during the Fronde. And the Fronde is a French Civil War uh, from about 1648 to 1652. And all hell broke loose. And there were soldiers throughout Paris um, and, and soldiers wreaking havoc in other major metropolitan areas in France. And kind of in response to this horrible trauma that everybody was suffering, many people, regular, common, non-academic, um, uh, non-high-status people, were writing their hearts out kind of in response to this trauma. And this writing was published almost entirely anonymously um, in these pamphlets called the Mazarinade. And I think at this point, um, uh, archivists have compiled about 5,500 of them, so a fair number. Mm -hmm. So within these Mazarinade, um, uh, I've uh, uh, searched through several indexes to try to isolate the ones that, that mention the violence of the day. Of those 5,500, there are about 450 that mention the violence of the day. And then of those 450 that talk about the violence, about five, five of them say they are written by soldiers. Um, and so one of the ones that's, that says it is written by a soldier um, is a, a soldier, it's a poem about a soldier who is um, having the night watch and he's doing night watch and he's thinking about how he used to be a civilian and life was better back then and this is how I know it was written by a soldier because it says ah I am on the night watch <laughs> <laughs> and I am a soldier and my life is kind of sad and the poem recounts that um, you know back when he was a civilian he worked at his anvil all day and then at night he'd sleep in a nice feather bed and on Sundays he'd play dice with his friends and he had plenty to eat but now he is a soldier and he eats black bread and he has the he has the night watch instead of being in his feather bed and he perpetuates all kinds of bad things and he even beats his civilian host and his wife and he kind of reflects on oh becoming a soldier has made me a worse person um, you know maybe maybe someday I can go back um, and so this kind of poem tells you a lot of things um, you know one it tells you that you know soldiers or at least this particular individual so I don't want to apply his experience to everybody but this particular individual was you know aware uh, uh, of the kind of suffering that his profession caused other people um, he regretted his civilian life he clearly did not want to be doing what he was doing um, and it also tells me that this barrier between civilian and soldier which is another stereotype that I think historians have and one that I have perpetuated in my first book I, I'm sorry 
um, uh, that this barrier between so soldier and civilian is much more porous than we thought it was. Um, and so historians like to talk about how um, once a soldier became a soldier, he was completely separate from the peasantry. And this seems to make sense because we know that there are many times when soldiers would pillage and they would prey on the peasantry and they would maybe for reasons of military expediency, they would have to burn homes and, you know, kill civilians and things like that. Um, but I don't know that those cases are necessarily representative of the entire soldier-civilian relationship because, because you have things like the militia or the bourgeoisie militia, or you have plenty of civilians who, in times of duress, were pressed into the army and then want to rejoin the civilian life as soon as they can. Or I have in my desertion cases um, uh, 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 civilians who decided to join the army and a few days in decided it was not for them and went back to their hometown. Uh, so here I have a poem, you know, written from, from the perspective of a soldier saying that he misses, um, he misses his civilian life. Um, I also have another poem written by a soldier um, where it's incredibly sad and the poem says, you know, I am a soldier, I woke up one morning and it was a beautiful day and I decided to go on walkabout and just take a risk and see if I could skitter away without my regiment noticing me. And then the soldier, as he's walking around, he interacts with soldiers of the line army who are eating disgusting soup with pig fat in it and are acting as though it's a wonderful meal because they're so hungry. He runs into those Swiss troops who are dining on fine pheasant because they are paid better. Um, and he runs into a buddy of his in a regiment and his buddy is so depressed and terrified because he knows he's gonna have to go fight soon and he's anticipating being killed. Um, and then the soldier goes back to his regiment and, and hopefully sneaks in unawares. I assume that he survives and is fine because he, he lives to write this poem. Um, but um, even if the poem is not a literal description of a soldier's day. Um, it's allowing the soldier to kind of discuss the things they see and discuss the things they run into and what this particular person is, is thinking about and reflecting on. And the fear of death is very present in yeah. that poem. Yeah. So one of the things that uh, we've talked about with people like Dr. Alexander Burns, um, same time period, uh, soldiers from different militaries, in particular uh, Prussian and, and English, is the ubiquity of religion in those soldiers' accounts. Uh, do you find the same thing in these, uh, whether they're, they're largely French Protestant soldiers or maybe Swiss, or excuse me, French Catholic or Swiss Protestant soldiers, do you find the same sense of religion and the ubiquity of, of faith in these accounts? I haven't yet, and which, which doesn't mean it's not there. I have, um, of, the, of the campaign correspondence, that 1A series, the, the A1 series I've been talking about, again, I'm looking at about 12% of what I know exists. So there's lots more work to be done if you're looking for a project. <laughs> um, but uh, so far, I have not seen many references to religion um, in those texts. Um, in the desertion court cases, um, they always begin with the person bearing witness or the person giving testimony, you know, giving their name, their age, their religion, um, and then taking an oath in which they swear to tell the truth. And so most of the time that religion is Catholic, sometimes, I've run across maybe two or three cases at this point where the religion is Protestant, um, uh, but that's the only mention made so far. The only other reference I have to religion at this point is that um, I know there were chaplains who traveled with the army um, or sometimes were found in hospitals. And I, I only know this because I have a letter from a chaplain who was writing on behalf of a very young soldier who was sick, who was trying to write home to his mother and explain that he was captured and kidnapped into service, which is very bad, you're not supposed to do that, that now he's sick in the hospital and he wants money. And so because the letter begins with, Dear Madam, hello, I am a chaplain and writing this letter. Right, right. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't, I haven't found religion being a huge part of soldier discourse yet. Interesting. Uh, one of the other very interesting things I found in, in particularly the research you presented this year was uh, this idea of a nom de guerre. Oh, the soldier takes this. on a name yes. that's different from their their baptismal name. Mm -hmm. So so what's the tradition of that and what do you think it means? So this is one of those things where I think people are, are um, identifying things that uh, link soldiers then with soldiers now. Because, you know, if you've seen Top Gun, you know that uh, uh, some military members still have call signs yep. and that those call signs are very important to them and a huge part of their identity and they often still prefer to go by those call signs. Um, and, I, and you can find other cultures where there are like given names and things like that. 
so I find though that first of all, every soldier I've come across so far has a nom de guerre, and that nom de guerre, that soldier name, is the name they prefer to go by. And the name is usually somehow descriptive. Um, so one of the main soldiers that I talk about in the paper is Joli Bois, which means beautiful wood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a very common last name in France now. Mm -hmm. um, other uh, soldier names that I've come across, um, uh, uh, prêt à boire, which means ready to drink, um, or sang froid, which means, literally means cold blood, but it means that you are brave in the face of um, uh, violence or scary things happening to you. You know, you have your sang froid. Um, uh, another name, probably, probably my favorite, um, is sauve les meubles, which means save the furniture. Although uh, one person said that that might be a French idiom for being friendly or happy. I, when I first saw that nom de guerre, I thought that maybe it meant that um, this person had a side business and used furniture. And so whenever they pillaged something, he'd shout out, save the furniture, because he was planning to use <laughs> right. it to make money or, right. or, or something like that. Um, so obviously I'm having a lot of interpretation um, or opportunities for interpretation when I look at these nom de guerre. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to understand better is exactly where these names came from. So I'm curious if um, there was maybe some kind of uh, minor or casual ritual when um, a civilian became a soldier or when an inhabitant entered the army and if he was kind of christened with this new name by his fellow soldiers. And I, I always think of the um, not to be presentist and this is what I'm this is what we have to be mindful of. But I always think of that scene in Animal House yeah. when, uh, when you know, the, they're the new members of, you know, the Delta fraternity and John Belushi is pouring beer on them and saying, you are mothball and yeah. you're Pinto. So, because they're those kinds of names. Right. So I always kind of wonder, was it something like that? Did the soldier choose his own new name? Um, you know, was there a time of, did you have to go out into the woods naked and then come back and the name would be revealed to you? And I have not come across at all what the process was or what the rituals were involved in this name. Um, only that uh, these names were important because whenever there is any official accounting of the soldier, they always give the soldier's baptismal name or Christian name, followed by whatever his nom de guerre is, whatever his soldier name is. And I do have um, a memoir, which is like a, a memo um, that an officer wrote to the Council of War suggesting improvements. Um, for the army in which he says, you know, officers' relationships with the soldiers would be better if the officers used their Christian names or their baptismal names rather than their soldier names. So apparently this is this the, the officers would use these nom de guerre to refer to their soldiers as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm hoping to kind of look at, e even if I can't find reference to exactly how this name was assigned to a soldier, um, I am hoping to kind of collect these names. I'm always very careful to take note of them. I want to collect as many names as I can and then even have maybe a chapter um, where I kind of take apart the names and look at which ones were most, um, were most common that I've been able to find, you know, what they meant, um, if I find that certain names appear most often in certain years, you know, things like that. Another um, uh, another name that I, I come across was like sans merci, sans merci, which means no mercy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so some of these, some of these sound like very fierce, like fierce names. Some of these sound like very jolly names. Some of them are very descriptive names, and then some are very Catholic names. So right. you have people who have names like Saint Francis, which is Saint Francis, or Saint Pierre, Saint Peter, mm -hmm. um, and the saint element is also is, is part of that nom de guerre. So sometimes you have these Catholic names. Um, uh, uh, so I'd, I'd like to spend some more time kind of unpacking what those might mean. Yeah, that's fascinating. It's, uh, it sounds like some exciting new directions in the studies of French soldiers. Dr. Osmond, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Hello, I'm here with Dr. Alexander Burns from Franciscan University at Steubenville. Dr. Burns, welcome. Thanks so much, Abel. It's great to be here. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, Dr. Burns, you involve yourself a lot in is kind of non-academic uh, history pursuits, uh, whether whether kind of on the hobby side or on the more uh, serious uh, research type side. Um, and in particular, three uh, related but probably distinct fields, um, video gaming, war gaming or board gaming, and uh, reenacting or, or living history. So first of all, kind of conceptually, um, Listeners are, are well familiar with the academic process of history, going to archives, reading secondary works, putting those together with archival and primary sources into books and articles and those kinds of things. Um, these these non-academic and perhaps non-traditional methods of history, uh, what do you think in general that they add to the field? Sure, that's a really good question. So 
I guess I would say they each add something different, um, and it's important, at least in my mind, not to be too positivist in our claims about what they what they add. I mean, certainly they're, they're hobbies, they think they're things we do for enjoyment, they can, can inform our thinking, maybe even should inform our thinking, but I'm, I'm not someone who looks at re- reenactments and says, wow, this is like experimental archaeology. I know what it was like to be an 18th century soldier because I've been a reenactor. That's not, I don't think that's a helpful framework uh, necessarily. Now, with that said, start with reenacting and then move into the gaming of the various types, whether video or on the tabletop. With reenacting, what it, what it can instruct you as a professional historian, as someone who just has an interest in history, what you're really getting, if you're, if you're doing it well is a greater appreciation for the world of the material culture um, in, in our period. That's the material culture of the 18th century. Mm-hmm. So how these these uniforms are constructed, what materials they're constructed from, maybe even some of the symbolism that goes into creating these armies that we often see in you know, oil paintings and things like this, um, you gain more of an appreciation, again, maybe not for the reality of the past, but for the limitations of the equipment and the, the mm-hmm. technology uh, that these soldiers um, were equipped with. Uh, so it, it is a way for you to, in conjunction with written sources, primary soldiers, from officers, from soldiers, to place yourself maybe in the mental space, not not of these soldiers themselves, but an approximation of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I mean, in this way, I think a natural ally of professional academic historians are people who work in, in living history or historic interpretation. I think of people like uh, Matt Cagle up at, up at Fort Ticonderoga um, and the, essentially he's a uniformologist, right? I mean, he's working not only about the detailed reality of, say, how you construct an 18th century grenadier cap, right. but also what that symbolized, what it meant with the significance of these items for the states and the armies that employed them. Uh, and so I, I do think that an understanding of material culture can also inform things like strategy or even even operations. I mean, if you look at the transition in the Prussian army, say, in the 1750s, from linen to wool gamashin or gaiters, like the lower leg wear these soldiers, uh, you know, wore, mm-hmm. it comes about because of the operational realities. Frederick loses most of Silesia, which is where the linen center in his, like the linen manufacturing center is in his state. Um, and so as a result, the army switches to wool because they don't have as much access to high quality linen anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And so material culture, again, being a reenactor does not immediately give you like some sort of magic insight into the past. I think that's a, that's a fallacy obviously. Um, But I, but I do think it's one part of the overall process of trying to, to as a historian develop empathy for the peoples of the past. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I, you know, there are there are many stories we disagree. Uh, my undergraduate advisor, a wonderful man named uh, David K. Burden, um, repeatedly uh, argued that reenactors essentially are destroying our understanding of the past. That they're a threat to the past. They're they're you know misleading the public, and. I, I think the truth is somewhere between between there and it's a magic bullet for you know reconstructing the past. So right. I, I think if you use it responsibly in a in a constructive way that's highly rigorous, and there are I mean there are groups out there who I mean this is like their life, right? Mm-hmm. I mean they they are dedicated to reproducing these garments, these pieces of equipment with period techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not going to go as far as to say it can be helpful in, in sort of your your academic writing. I mean, I, I, in my book that's coming out in August, I do acknowledge some reenactors who I think have helped me frame frame problems in the book, for example. Um, but again, if if especially as as 18th century historians who are often trying to reconstruct a world with imperfect written sources, mm-hmm. this is maybe an additional tool that the historian can grab out of their toolkit to try and develop a greater historical empathy and maybe even an understanding of the past. Mm-hmm. 
So let's uh, let's dive more deeply into this. Um, on, on you've mentioned a few terms that uh, I think it's it's helpful to parse: um, living history, reenactment. Mm. I'll throw antiquarian in there, sure. um, which is a term that that certainly belongs to the past. Um, Experimental archaeology, you also mentioned. Yeah. So, what what are, what are the effective differences between these different fields or approaches? Absolutely. So, so I would say, at its most basic level, um, reenacting traditionally has meant from the 1960s and 70s to the present day in, in America and now broadly in the Western world, um, dressing up in military uniforms and participating in mock battles. Mm-hmm. And if you look at like the Photos and videos coming out, you know, or that, that that were taken in the 60s and 70s. Sometimes you'd see people were, you know, reenacting the American Civil War wearing blue jeans, right? I mean, it, it, there there is certainly a sliding scale of quality. Right. In many reenactment groups in the United States today, we haven't advanced much further beyond that in terms of seriously engaging with the past in, in the material culture. I mean, yes, you, know, you might wear a uniform that looks something like an 18th century uniform, but it's essentially a form of cosplaying, uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to going through the process of trying to meticulously um, you know, reconstruct these garments using period techniques. Living history, um, or what some might call hardcore or progressive reenacting, is more about trying to recreate the details of the life of the soldier, not for the public perspective, which is often the view of reenactments, we're going to have a mock battle and 100,000 people can come and buy a ticket and watch it. Right. Okay. So living history, hardcore reenacting, progressive reenacting, again, all these are are terms that sometimes I view interchangeably. This is more about what it can teach you um, going out and doing an 18-mile march in straight last shoes constructed by period techniques. How, how does that inform you? What, do you? what do your feet feel like at the end of that process? Right. Um, what does it feel like to eat period rations constructed with period recipes? So, so my, my wife and I um, do volunteer work at um, the Frontier Culture Museum in Stanton, Virginia. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an incredible experience one, you're informing the public because it's a it's an open air museum. Two, you're informing yourself. Um, you're in a house that was literally constructed in the 1680s in the Rhineland. You're you're cooking using period techniques from period recipes from from the middle of the 18th century. Um, are you recreating the past? No, um, but you are trying to get closer, maybe in an imperfect way, of putting yourself in the mental world or or at least the physical world. Um, of people who lived, in, in that case, in like a civilian world in the 18th century. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that's another key difference. Reenacting is essentially about trying to, maybe in a positive and effective way, maybe not, recreate the military formations um, mm-hmm. of, the, of these periods. Whereas hardcore reenacting, progressive reenacting, you often find civilian uh, people who engage in living history. You often find as opposed to trying to kind of shambolically recreate a miniature version of a 18th century standing army, you have, you have say, in the case of the American Civil War, really dedicated individuals um, like the Liberty Rifles who would try to create one unit at a specific place in time, trying to recreate a specific company of this unit, yeah. sort of going through the same, uh, the same processes that, that that unit did, say, in, in approaching the battlefield or what they ate. Uh, based on what we can know from from written sources. Beyond this, we have the realm of things like historic interpretation. These are people who are professionals, in the same way that we are professional historians. Mm -hmm. People like Matt Cagle, um, Davis Tierney at the Frontier Culture Museum, they're professionals in interpreting the past for the public. And they... They have maybe a slightly different but related set of goals as we do as historians, trying to trying to bring the past uh, to people's minds, trying to you know sort of make the past tangible and, and graspable. Um, one of the things that I often struggle with as a professional academic historian, um, if you look at uh, Samuel Tilden's principles inter- of interpretation, he argues one of the main goals of the interpreter is to provoke, so not just to engage in reconstructing the past, but do so in a way that is um, 
almost provocative, or it really leaves the the person touring this open air museum with a lot of questions. Kind of an affective uh, approach. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then last, and I, I want to be careful because I don't want to get death threats from reenactors, but like maybe least is is this concept of experimental archaeology, the idea that. Um, we can know what it was like to be in an ancient Greek hoplite clash by trying to simulate this right. in and the I, modern in the modern world. I think the person who has done a lot of this visibly over the last twenty years is probably Ruth Goodman. Sure, she makes these experimental archaeology shows. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say, I I, I watch and enjoy those shows. Right. Oh, yeah. Um. I mean, yeah, my wife and I are watching Tudor Monastery Farm right yeah, now. Right. If I um, find one, I definitely watch it too. Yeah. I mean, I again. The, the people who go into making television programs like this often do have formal training, perhaps perhaps as historians, perhaps as archaeologists. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, so often when we go to conferences like the one we're at now, um, the Consortium of the Revolutionary Era, and we talk to academic historians, people who are trying to grapple with the past are very eager to put themselves into silos and say right. we don't want to really think about this and you know we're academic historians we write papers those people who dress up are a lot um, and the, vice versa the, the people who dress up would say only writing papers is sterile absolutely um, and so I, I think again and there's there's no magic solution here there's no lesson um, but I but I think that trying to have you at least, if not your foot, maybe your toe in a couple of these worlds can make you a little bit more well-rounded. It can it can for it can bring questions to your mind that being an academic historian may, maybe it makes you a better um, progressive reenactor. Um, being a progressive reenactor, perhaps depending on your topic, depending on the type of reenacting you do, maybe it can bring up questions in your mind that you tackle uh, in, in the academic world. Um, and so just trying to, I think, silo these groups out and say never shall the two meet is not helpful. So so the panel that we, j- we just came from, Abel, um, afterwards a couple people were uh, discussing wargaming at mm-hmm. academic conferences. And th- these are two historians who... Are, are military adjacent or social military historians, and they were essentially saying, "Man, what what a weird academic conference that people play war games here! Like, like how nuts is this?" Right. Um, and absolutely, you know, it, it can be easy for professional academic historians, maybe in a, a way that smacks of I don't want to say elitism or snobbery, but. The seriousness of our work right. can look down on people who try to engage with the past in more popular ways. I mean, by the same token, and I, you know, I'm guilty of this. I I wrote a long thread hating on Ridley Scott on Twitter. Um, there are two panels at this at this conference evaluating the Napoleon movie that right. came out last year, right? And so, in some ways, we seem to pick and choose as professionals. It's acceptable to you know watch Napoleon and 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 you know evaluate this movie from a historical standpoint. Mm-hmm. Is it acceptable to war game? Is it acceptable to reenact? And and right. sometimes I wonder how, you know are these categories fairly artificial? Yeah, no, and and that's a good transition into talking about. I, I think we have well established both on this podcast and more broadly the value of war gaming. I teach at a professional military education institution. We have a war gaming department. Um, and, and you are, are a, a committed war gamer um, as well. So uh, kind of briefly, what do you see as the value of war gaming? Absolutely. So if, if the value of reenacting or living history or whatever you want to call it is trying to put yourself um, in the in the milieu or the, or the area of these individuals, mm-hmm. the value of maybe, maybe not war gaming itself, but trying to trying to construct a, a model by which you war game um, allows you to maybe more fully grapple with the operational side of history. I mean, if, if living history is trying to predominantly answer more social history questions, I think war gaming is primarily interested in operational and tactical and, and you know, to some extent, strategic questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for the perspective of the military historian, again... I sure hope n- no academic historian will play a war game of the Battle of Waterloo and think, "Man, I know what it was like now. This is this is you know 
this is all I need to do. Right. Um, I, again, I, I'm very wary of kind of positive claims that this should inform us, this experiential thing mm-hmm. should inform us more than the written word. I'm an academic historian. Right. It's my bias. Um, but with that said, I do think if you're going to engage with military history in a way that we might call guns and trumpets or operational history or tactical history, wargaming can do what reenacting does for the social historian for this you know, old military history practitioner or whatever, whatever the right, the right or right. politically correct things they call it these days is, right? right? So the, the, the value that I think we find, and I'm going to steal a quote from my colleague, Dr. James Starrett, is, as you say, the war game doesn't allow you to walk a mile in the shoes mm-hmm. of the people playing, but it does allow you to walk a step or two in their socks. Mm-hmm. And I think the thing that, that, that we really value war games for is the, the decision-making process under stress. Now, obviously, it's not combat stress, but the, the, the time and uh, scenario pressure enables people to understand how you make decisions and given a certain amount of information. Um, and I think that's really valuable. Now, as, as, as we said, war games are ubiquitous now in professional military education, in militaries, in Congress. There's, there are reports that come out of Congress every week about aides and Congress people playing war games. Uh, but by and large, these are physical war games or physical war games maybe with a computer assist. Mm-hmm. I think the bridge we have not yet crossed, because everything we've talked about so far, there is an element of academia too. Mm -hmm. The bridge that we have not yet crossed is video games, Mm -hmm. despite the ubiquity of history set video games, whether they're first person type games like Kingdom Come Deliverance, which Mm -hmm. aspires to be historically accurate, or in particular the strategy or 4X type games like the Total War series, um, the games that Paradox makes, mm-hmm. uh, like Europa Universalis or yeah. Crusader Kings. Um, so first of all, why do you think video games are seen differently from physical board, board games or, uh, or reenacting or, or whatever? Sure, that's a really good question. Um, I, I guess I would say I don't necessarily view them terribly differently. I, th- I think one is, is the, the physical war game, the board game, the tabletop war game, is doing something in a physical, in a relational space. Mm-hmm. Um, and to some extent, the digital video war game is trying to allow that same experience to be facilitated over distance or even even solo by yourself. Now, right. there, there are solo physical board games or war games that you can, you can play. Um, to some extent, I, this may be... This, in how they're viewed differently. This may be a cultural bias. Mm-hmm. Um, I come from a relatively conservative social background in terms of my upbringing, um, in, in uh, coming out of the of the homeschool movement. And I you heard a lot of anti video game rhetoric growing up. Like I, you know, it makes young men lazy. They just want to sp- spend all day playing video games in their basement. You know, this is no way. This is no way to raise uh, a generation of serious thinkers. And so. I think it's important to, much as we might say, not all reenacting is helpful. Um, not all tabletop wargaming is is helpful in instructing strategic thought or operational thought, um, making people react in in a limited amount of time and maybe a slightly stressful way uh, to the issue of decision making. Um, in video games. I'm not sure that playing Call of Duty is going to make you a better infantryman, right? Right. Um, In fact, maybe in some ways it might not. Right. Um, You don't respawn. Exactly right. Uh, But at the same time, video games that attempt to, to some extent, recreate the operational problems of, of wargaming writ large that we've seen from the, develop historically from like the middle of the 18th century on... Mm-hmm. Um, the the first English language military war game that I'm familiar with is an officer's pamphlet that comes from 1760 in Britain, uh, where essentially this this lieutenant colonel outlines how you would run a tabletop top exercise for the officers of the battalion. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, you know he he 
goes into things like what are the movement rates, you know, for the for the platoon of, of soldiers that you're commanding. How do you how do you deploy uh, the the regiment from you know column of platoons into line of battle? Um, these are are things that in a tabletop wargaming setting, in a tactical or operational video game setting, I, I can see a lot of continuity there between the 1760s mm-hmm. and sort of what what we're doing either in a physical or a digital space today. By and large, I, I, war gamers, although Games Workshop, uh, the people who make Warhammer 40K, the popular science fiction tabletop game, right. have done a lot to try and change this. War gaming is tabletop war gaming is still viewed as more of a niche hobby, um, yeah. even if people like Henry Cavill are engaged in it. Mm-hmm. Um, w- so real quick, so people understand, when we say tabletop gaming, we're talking about gaming with lots of miniatures, mm-hmm. physical miniatures that are usually uh, gorgeously hand-painted mm-hmm. using lots of man hours. Absolutely. And, and so this process is... To some extent, there's a much higher sunk cost than there is in video gaming, where you buy a, you know, when I was growing up, like a $30 video game, now a $70 video game, um, that you then don't have to paint the figures, you don't have to, you know, set up the scenario, you don't have to buy the terrain or paint little houses or trees. You can right. you can just put on the computer and, and ponder a operational and tactical problem. Right. And so, I think to some extent, the reason why we have a cultural reaction maybe against video games and not against tabletop exercises is that one video games have gone mainstream maybe in a way that that physical war gaming has yet to do yeah and two i do think there might be some institutional bias i mean you can you can trace the roots of tabletop war gaming exercise to the middle of the 18th century or you know if you, if you want to be very very strict, like the Kriegspiel exercises the Prussians do in the in the middle, the, excuse me, the early nineteenth century. Mm-hmm. Whereas video games are something that you know only come out in the last. I, I maybe some video game people will, will, will say I'm mischaracterizing, but since like nineteen ninety or just before nineteen ninety. Yeah, and uh, and it's worth pointing out too the ones that that try some element of historical accuracy. Uh, those those are late '90s at best, yeah. simply because the graphics and processing capabilities required for them are higher, Absolutely. particularly above the kind of petty tactical level of something like Call of Duty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, given that there is this divide, and it's worth pointing out, one of the reasons that uh, the the gaming folks that I work with don't use a lot of virtual stuff is mm-hmm. high barrier to entry. You got to have the physical equipment, and there, there are very few good war games, digital war games, that don't require a massive time investment to understand. You know, the joke about Paradox Games is the first thousand hours of the tutorial. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you think that gap might be bridged to bring digital gaming to the place where physical war gaming is as a useful tool? Sure. So I, I guess I would say, I one, I'm not sure that it's not a useful tool now. Um, second, I, I do think to some extent it's just going to be an issue of time. Um, I've been teaching in higher education at the college level since 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, in most of my upper level classes during that time, I've used either some sort of physical, I, not always war games, I mean sometimes it's like a social simulation. Right. Um, either digitally um, or physically, and the benefits that you know you you describe with tabletop or physical wargaming, those by and large transfer over into the digital space. You're trying you're giving students a set amount of time. In in the case of things like the reacting to the past games, um, it enables you to. Again, have students seriously think about this. There are consequences, right? I mean, in all all the games I run, the the winning team will get a you know, slight percentage of extra credit on the on the midterm of the final exam. And so there are there are very soft real world consequences for the right. failure. Right. Um, and so there, there's a bit of you know an edge of hey, maybe I should really uh, you know uh, try and be invested in this simulation. It develops historical empathy. It allows you to see the the challenges and the parameters i mean I, one of the one of the problems that 
whether we're talking about large professional military tabletop exercises or you know in a civilian academic class is students often want to do something different than what's in the simulation. They want to answer the problem in a, in a different way and, and what you're trying to do is get them to see sort of within the framework and the possibilities of the past what, what was possible. It's a, way to, it's a way to, I don't love this term, but a way to live the past forward as opposed right. to looking at the past in hindsight. Right. I guess I would also um, say that whether we like it or not, and you know, again, I'm, I'm not trying to say that a, you, you probably shouldn't play Call of Duty to learn to be an infantryman. Um, a, as a way of engaging with the past, sometimes in class, I will literally describe a very complex early modern historical phenomena in terms of a paradox game, mm -hmm. and. I'll explain what I mean in, in non-video game terms, but there is a, a subset of student where instantly that clicks. Right. And so, for example, in my, my history of Eastern Europe class at Franciscan this semester, we were talking about um, essentially the, the reductions in Sweden in the, in the 1680s and, and earlier in the 17th century. And... I looked at my student Paul, who I know is a huge EU4 guy, and and I said, Paul, what you know, what is, what are they what are they doing here? Describe this process for us. And he says, well, they're interacting with the estates panel and they're clicking the seize land from the nobility button. And so, yep. in games like EU4, I mean, it's it, jokingly say you're playing a spreadsheet, right? I mean, it's it's a huge and complex game. But a game of that complexity also allows you to represent, maybe in EU4, not things on the tactical level in a really granular way, but it's almost like a, you know, a society simulator. And, um, and to, to play on that, I think the value of a, of a paradox type game is, and for people who aren't familiar, these are games that are immersive, they're based in history, and they last centuries. Yeah. So the, the choices that your student is making in dealing with the estates of his realm may have repercussions a hundred years down the line in yeah. the game. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's one of the things that I think video games can do better than physical games. Because physical games generally require physical presence. And even you know, the most hardcore physical gamer can only play them for, for you know, 8, 10, 12 hours at a time. Whereas with a video game, you can you can turn it on and off, and you can so you could truly see the consequences of strategic decision making. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, this has been a fascinating discussion, Dr. Burns. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me on. Here. If you like this episode, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Broad Gauge Gossips, where we talk to members of the Department of Military History faculty, so you can get to know them.